Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place where we discuss what makes you your soul's highest involvement. If it is your first time listening, welcome. This is the place where we discuss all things spiritual and make it fun, easy, and relatable. So thank you for being here on your divine journey. And if you are here every week, what's up? How are you? I am grateful for you. I see you thriving in 2020. I see you making those right choices. I see you get into alignment. Don't think I don't notice. Don't think I don't notice. I see you. I see you. And I appreciate you. So we are about to hit a new moon and this new moon is taking place January 24th. And if you're listening to this episode after, you're still probably going to be hitting a new moon within the next month because they happen every single month. So just Google new moon whenever you're listening to this and you'll find yours. But this podcast is about how to manifest with the moon. So Astrology is extremely trendy and popular right now, which I'm super grateful for. And in the past couple of years, I've also been interested more and more in astrology and seen how accurate and true it is. And a lot of us talk about the sun signs. I think a lot of astrology we've been focused on, like, what's your sign? And, you know, that's actually related to our sun sign. And I've had conversations on this podcast with Vedic astrologers. But what we haven't talked about specifically are the lunar phases. And this is something that's really important in astrology because we are very affected by the moon. I mean, the moon is exactly what creates the, the tides of the ocean. So if you can see that the ocean is being pulled so deeply by the moon and the ocean is water. We are 70% water, the exact same percentage of salt as the ocean. Then how can we not think that the moon doesn't affect us? It absolutely affects us. And there's so much science now that people are seeing that people are behaving differently on full moons. Actually, there's a statistic that shows that there are more murders on full moons, probably because people are going crazy. But in this episode, we don't talk about murders. We talk about how to manifest good things that we do want with the moon. So I met Ezzy Spencer when I was in New York during my book launch and she was at a Mind Body Green dinner that I was speaking at. And I absolutely loved what she was doing of teaching people how to have rituals according to the moon and the eight lunar phases which she talks about on this podcast, which is super interesting because again, most of us, myself including, think about the four phases of the moon, but it's actually eight. And then the different energies related to each one. So how we can manifest according to what is happening in the moon at any given time. And then every single month we have the invitation to start fresh with a new lunar cycle and begin our new manifestation. So this is an opportunity for you to call in what you are manifesting for the new moon. And she will also be doing a live workshop in Rose Gold Goddesses exclusively with Rose Gold Goddess members. So you can participate if you're a member of Rose Gold Goddesses or you can become a member by heading over to rosegoldgoddesses.com. Again, that is rosegoldgoddessesplural.com. I will have that link in the show notes. She'll be doing a live webinar on the actual new moon. And this webinar will be recorded and available for you to do again every single month. So you will have her exact ritual at bay for you. And that in itself is so incredibly valuable because she is an expert in this topic. And as she shares in this podcast, actually gave up her career as a lawyer to dedicate herself to lunar abundance rituals. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ezzy Spencer to the Highest Self Podcast. Oh my goddess, sister queen, I am so excited to share with you that Rose Gold Goddesses is officially open. We are accepting new members for the most high vibe community on the interwebs and in real life as well. What Rose Gold Goddesses is, is your sacred sisterhood collective. We have our very own app with all types of content to support you on your spiritual journey. From all of my master classes, I upload content specifically for Rose Gold Goddesses from manifestation to launching a podcast to writing a book and everything in between to support you on your journey of becoming your highest self. 
there are thousands of like-minded women who are there to connect with you, whether you want to meet up for a cup of ceremonial cacao or talk about your dharma or whatever it is that you need support with at this time, Rose Gold Goddesses has got you. Consider it your spiritual gym membership with all things to support you on your journey of becoming your highest self. So you can come join us at Rose goldgoddesses.com. Again, that is rosegoldgoddesses.com. And we are so excited to welcome you in. You know, when you open up a box and are in love, that is what happened when I opened up the kits from Anima Mundi Herbals. Their Sacred Heart Love Kit has my favorites, including Blue Lotus Tea, which enhances intuition, Makuna, which enhances dopamine, Cacao, which opens the heart, Ethically Sourced Palo Santo Mist, and their Euphoria Elixir. It is divinity in a box and pairs perfectly with their coconut milk powder. I mean, Anima Mundi is literally my love language, and I know you are going to be obsessed with her stuff, which you can learn more about on episode 240 with the founder. She's gifted us a generous 20% off, which you can get at animamundiherbals.com with coupon code Sahara. That's Anima mundiherbals.com A-N-I-M-A-M-U-N-D-I herbals.com with coupon code Sahara. Welcome, Ezzy, to the Highest Self Podcast. It's so good to have you here. So the first question I would love to ask you is, what makes you your highest self? Oh, it's when I'm just absolutely in alignment with what I'm feeling and also what I'm doing in the world. So when I'm really fully living on purpose and then really feeling totally lit up by whatever it is that, you know, I'm doing or saying or operating it in any one way at any one time. Mm, so true and so important in today's world where we're often very scattered in, in many different directions. Totally. So I am obsessed with your new book and journal, Lunar Abundance, and it has really been educational for teaching me about the different phases of the moon in a deeper way and how to kind of like set up your schedule with the moon. So I would love to walk through just a lunar cycle and how we can optimize our lives, our calendars, our sex lives, abundance, everything with the help of Mama Luna. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And it's just, I mean, what I love about the moon is just how practical it can be when we sync up with it in that way, where it really can enhance all the parts of our lives, exactly as you've just described. So I work with eight phases of the moon, which a lot of people, of course, I mean, people know about the new moon, people know about the full moon, but I love breaking down the moon phases in a way which is actually like a lot more practical and juicy and relevant. So it's not just something that we check into once a month or twice a month when it's like, oh my gosh, you know, why am I feeling like so out of control at this moment? You know, it must be the moon, but rather really harness that energy and be able to live in the flow of life and really be able to, you know, tap into the ease, you know, and that, you know, it real like juicy femininity, creativity, sensuality, everything that the lunar cycle has to offer. So the way that it really starts is to tune in at the new moon. And it is, I work with the moon as a natural timekeeper. And I also work with the moon as really a a mirror, a trigger for us to come within. So when we think about the moon or when we see the moon in the sky, the invitation is always to come within. And the reason for that is, is because the moon represents the feelings. It represents the emotional world. It represents, you know, the feminine part of ourselves, you know, the part of ourselves, which is a little more hidden, you know, but which is so real and uh, so, you know, beautifully, you know, easy to access once we know how to do it and once we practice how to do it. So setting an intention at the new moon is the way to really start to harness this energy and to start to get into this contact you know, just get into contact with this beautiful sort of, you know, rhythmic energy. By setting an intention, what I mean is not just like getting into our heads and thinking in a very goal-oriented way, like what is it that we want to achieve in the next month, the moon cycle lasts for a month, but actually reframing it and coming into how 
we are feeling, how we want to feel, and what it is that we want to receive in the month ahead. And this is really how we start to become more magnetic. This is how we start to really invite towards us the kind of opportunities which are going to support us to live as our, you know, in our highest self, be able to really actualize our purpose and, and whatever our dharma is. But to be able to, you know, be so intentional about what it is that we are welcoming in, what it is that we are attracting into our lives, and then taking very, very intentional discerning action in the most effective and efficient way. So it's a dance between receiving and then going out into the world and taking action, but taking action with discernment and with simplicity so that we're able to protect our precious reserves of time and energy. So again, starting at that new moon by tuning into what our intention is in terms of what it is that we want to attract into our life, what we want to invite into our life and what it would feel like for us to be able to invite that in. By feelings, I mean the physical sensations in our bodies. So really dropping into the embodiment of what it would actually already feel like for what it is that we desire to already be here in our lives. But again, you know, giving ourselves that cellular memory by tuning into those physical sensations and then being able to, you know, really link it to pleasant emotional states. So getting out of like the fear and the scarcity or, you know, I'm not worth that, you know, not worthy, not worthy. Who am I to be able to deserve that which I so desire? But tuning into you know, these states of like joy and gratitude that this is already coming towards us, this is already real, like of course it is something that we deserve. If it's there as a desire in our heart, if our heart is yearning for it, you know, if our soul wants it, then you know that kernel, that seed is there for us. So planting that seed and aligning our intention with that seed, anchoring it into how it is that we want to feel is the very first step at the new moon, at the first day of this month-long moon cycle. And then from that point, there's a lot to talk about. We can dive into the phases in in depth Mm -hmm. and in, in detail, but there's a rhythm in the lunar abundance practice, which is around being and doing and dancing between, you know, this state of inviting in and receiving and then going out into the world in a way to take, again, you know, that inspired intentional action to help to take us further towards what our dreams actually are. And so the way that I work with the eight moon phases is that those moon phases alternate. So the first moon phase, the new moon phase, that's a doing phase. And the doing there is actually the setting of the intention, aligning, you know, our will, our purpose, getting that clarity around what it is. And this is the phase immediately after the new moon, right? Oh, the, so that's actually the new moon phase. So that's the, so the doing. Oh, as, the new moon is. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So we start off with the doing because we need to initiate. And so, mm. you know, the doing doesn't actually need to be that, oh, you know, the hustle and the grind and the go, go, go and the doing and the, you know, all of sort of the pushing the rock up the hill. So many of us, you know, are, are sort of used to that busyness. It can be very, very simple and simple doesn't always mean easy though. You know, doing the new moon intention setting process can often take a a lot of courage to carve out that space and that time and to really go within to find out what it is that you are really craving at any particular time. It might not be what your mind thinks when you start to tune in and listen to your body and listen to your heart. The whispers that come through might actually be surprising to you. And so that's why it's a doing phase. Then the next phase, the crescent moon phase, the second of the eight moon phases is a being phase. So more of a yin phase. And so many of us, you know, would you consider each phase like one week? So from new moon to one week after, or like three days before, three days after with the new moon being in the middle? So the way that the phases are divided up, so the moon cycle lasts for about a month. So it's 29 and a half days is the moon cycle. And then the eight phases of the moon tend to be three or four days apiece. So the new moon phase will last for three or four days. So that's the first of the eight phases. Then the second of the eight phases, the crescent moon phase, again, will be three or four days. And then the next phase will be three or four days. So in a week, exactly as you say, in a week, then there'll be that opportunity to have half the week as like the doing mode and then the other half of the week as the being mode. Mm, Got it. Okay. Because I think, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of us, get confused because I've always thought that new moon was like you go inward and it's a time to like be in your little yoni temple. So this is interesting how you consider it the doing phase, but the doing of it is the intention setting of it. 
Exactly right. Now, what's really interesting is that doing and being are always going to be relative to each other. So if someone is used to working with like the new moon and the full moon, like two moon phases in the course of the month, then the full moon is going to be, you know, more doing in a relative way. And the new moon will be more being in a relative way, right? If you're only working with two phases, if you're comparing the new moon with the full moon, then that's going to be how it will be broken down. What I found though, when I started to work with the moon cycle was that working just with two moon phases didn't have me really deeply connected to these themes throughout the entire month. So what I found is that working with the eight moon phases gave me more of a structured framework around how the moon could be relevant and the moon cycle could help to inform like my calendar and my daily life. And so in that way, so we're still working with the interchangeability with the doing phases and the being phases, but bringing in eight moon phases, there's more applicability, right, to the way that we can work with those times of going within and being more quieter and always actually being connected with our intuition. You know, that's something which is going to be consistent throughout the entire month. But the new moon phase is actually going to have more of that doing element because of the intention setting process. But then the companion phase to the new moon phase, the crescent moon phase, so we can obviously see that crescent moon in the sky, that's going to be the being phase. So that's going to be the time where there's an invitation to actually, again, you know, come within even more so than we do at the new moon phase. Then it switches again at the next moon phase. So the third of the eight moon phases is the first quarter moon phase. And that's when the moon is a quarter of the way around the earth. And it's actually appears like it's half full in the sky at that time. Now that's going to be a time, another doing phase. So again, you know, these doing being phases are coming in pairs in this way. And so at the first quarter moon phase, there's often a real rush of energy. And this can be the time where we can really take again, like that intentional action to move us towards our our dream and our wish, the seed that we've planted and the seed that we've been watering and paying attention to in our daily meditation practice in our tuning in and really, you know, sort of plumping up that seed and and getting ready for the kind of action that we'll take a one week into the moon cycle at that first quarter moon phase. Mm, love that so much. And I love just the the subtleties of it, how we really are ebbing and flowing. It's like a wave goes in and out. And I really like how you've defined them into these eight stages that, you know, you set your intention and then you come back and then you take action on it and then you regroup. And then I'm sure the next one is like, you really go into it. <laughs> Exactly right. And this is how I found I could start to live a really sustainable life. I started out as a lawyer, as a human rights lawyer, so I knew all about the hustle and the grind. And what I found is that I was also consistently working, walking that line of burnout, right? Like I needed to find a way where I had more ease and flow in my own life, but I didn't want to give up being productive and effective and achieving as well, right? So I needed to find a practice which would allow me to really find that sweet spot of being able to take these permission slips really. And that's what I find the being phases of the moon or the yin phases of the moon really are for me. They're permission slips, you know, to say no to events, to say no to extra work, you know, to say yes to myself and drawing inwards consistently throughout the month, not just, you know, once a month, but consistently throughout the month and to build in that into my schedule. So then I can live in a way which is going to be sustainable, but then I'm going to have much more energy for the times where it is time for me to come out into the world and take the action. And I'm also going to have the clarity of thought and intention for me to know what is going to be the smartest action for me to take in those times so then I can get the greatest possible impact. Mm, I love that. So beautiful. And when I read that you were a human rights lawyer, my dream was to become a human rights lawyer. So I was like, oh, I, I so feel it. And I think a lot of people listening to had that similar dream because we thought that the only way we could help people is through, you know, doing what we thought was possible, like working in a corporate setting in law, helping people in this way. And I think that so many healers just have this desire to help. And it's so fascinating how I see so many people like walk this line between like spirituality and activism and really how connected they are. Oh, so much so. Yeah. And it's so exciting that we have these opportunities that the, and that we're all carving out these paths to walk now because these careers didn't exist 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So I think it's just always about coming, you know, within and seeing what 
really turns you on and what lights you up and to be able to show up in the world and be of service in a way that's going to be completely authentic to you even if that doesn't necessarily make sense to the people around you. And that was the case for me, you know, my colleagues, my family were like, what is this that you're doing? As You know, when I started to talk about the moon, but you know what? It just felt so right to me when I was talking about it. And this is before Instagram, you know, this is before the moon started trending on the internet, anything like that. (laughs) You know, it was just something that I had this, you know, innate curiosity. I'd had a fascination with the moon cycle ever since I was a little girl, you know, she just started to talk to me and to whisper to me and to guide me towards what was really, you know, something elemental that was missing from my life. And she's continued to open up a life of mystery and magic and so much expansion and abundance, which I couldn't even have planned it when I was back working in the law, because I couldn't even have imagined how, you know, magical and amazing my life could be now. But the moon has been what has led me down that path. Wow, that's so beautiful. And for those of you listening out there who are like, I'm in this job that, you know, I was really passionate about and maybe it's not fully serving me. Let this be such a beautiful example for you that that thing that you're curious about, maybe a fascination you've had since the time you were a child can be that thing that is your dharma, that is the life's work that you put out into the world. So thank you for sharing that. One question I have is how did you make these lunar phases work when you had a job like being a lawyer? Like You couldn't decide when your workload was coming to you. You couldn't decide what your clients needed from you. Sometimes I struggle because, for example, I'm like on my period, which is supposed to be a yin time, and I have to be on my speaking tour. So how do you make it work with just the happenings of the world that you can't control? It's such a good question. And the answer to that is I created this practice when I was in that particular kind of environment. So I did need to create something practical that was going to work for me. So it was really born from that place. And so, you know, the way that I would work with these being phases and doing phases, or you know, sort of the yin and the yang, and originally was around just finding those spaces, those places where I was able to exert some personal agency. And then also surrendering to the time where I didn't and just recognizing that, you know, and I was working in a more structured, you know, corporate environment that were just going to have to be those times where I just had to continue to show up and be a professional, right? And so what I would find is that, you know, I would try to organize my own work life and then also my own personal life, you know, in as much integrity, as much authenticity as possible. And so I would find the ways where, for example, you know, I could say, you know, do block out some time on my own calendar, you know, were there meetings that I absolutely had to go to, you know, were there ways even just within a very, you know, busy, you know, 12 hour work day with a lot of demands on my time, you know, were there ways in a yin phase where I could actually say, no, you know, that's something which, you know, I'm going to have to prioritize this other deadline, this other kind of work. And I know that I'll be able to, you know, get you a better result. You know, if I was speaking to a superior, you know, I'll get you a better result, you know, if I've got this amount of time, you know, to be able to deep dive into this because the yin phases or the being phases can be wonderful times to actually do more unstructured work, you know, the more kind of creative work if you have that available. And yes, even as a lawyer, I would find those times where I would have those available. The other ways, that I would make this work for me is not necessarily taking on extracurricular activities after work. So giving myself again the permission to say no to things, even if, for example, something looked good on paper, it looked like it might promote my career, or indeed, you know, I would have like this feeling of, you know, responsibility and obligation to go to something, you know, I would really tune in with myself. And what I'd see over time is that if I continue to push myself in these being phases to try to continue to do all the things, you know, and try to complete all of the projects and just to keep saying yes all the time to everything that everybody was asking of me, then I was going to burn out. I wasn't actually going to do as good a job. You know, I wasn't going to be as effective. So when I was able to really acknowledge that, claim that, and then communicate that in an effective way, which demonstrated that, you know, I had a sense of of knowledge about what myself 
I guess, what my own needs were in any given situation, you know, in order to get to the particular goal or outcome that, you know, my employer wanted for me or, you know, my friends wanted for me or my family wanted for me. When I was able just to really release any of my own guilt around having to try to do it all, all the time, and just be able to, you know, communicate in a really clean and healthy way, then that helped me to be able to say no to things both professionally and personally. And I think there's a lot of fear around doing that, you know, partly because we are worried about missing out and, you know, we're worried about you know, missing out sometimes in social settings, but obviously as well when we can be career and achievement oriented, you know, but I think that what then happens when you are able to really, you know, take charge of, again, like find these places within your schedule where you can have some agency, then what then can happen is that you're going to show up bigger and better in the other environments, you know, in the next phase, you know, in the, in the next couple of days, you're going to be be able to, you know, deliver and on a report or a particular job to a client, do a much better job in a way which is going to continue to build up evidence, you know, for them that you are someone who, you know, actually does know yourself and knows your rhythms and knows your cycles and that you're able to, you know, to really understand, you know, where you can try to get the win-wins with people as well. And the other ways, you know, that this can play out can be, you know, as subtle as the kind of foods that you're eating, you know, in a yin phase, you know, be, pay a little bit more attention to eating perhaps more, you know, grounded, earthy foods and, you know, consider how a yin phase or a being phase might be a different way for you to experiment with different kinds of meditation, different self-care practices, perhaps, you know, different ways of working out. Or consider going for, you know, a walk or maybe a yin yoga class or a yoga nidra class, like something a little gentler rather than something which is more high impact or high intensity, you know, more sort of cardio strengths oriented, which could be better suited for a doing phase. So there's plenty of ways where you can sort of experiment and play around with how you can make these beings phases work for you, which is going to be realistic with the contours of, of your particular schedule and, and obligations. Mm, I love that. And I think it's really inspiring. Like if you as a lawyer were able to make it work, like a <laughs> lot of us who feel like, oh, well, my boss is not going to be okay with that. Like I feel like law firms having worked with clients who are lawyers is some of the toughest schedules. So that's really inspiring that you were able to make it work. So did you tell, for example, your superiors, did you tell them the reason why is because of the lunar phase? Or did you just say like, I'm not able to do my best work right now, but I can do it next week without explaining the lunar reason? I love that question because I think that's actually a critical question because I think it wouldn't have gone down as well if I'd started to talk about the moon in the more traditional environments that I was operating in at that time. I feel like the most effective and potent way to be able to communicate is always to use the language which is going to really land and resonate with the people who are around you. So, for example, when I was working in a more traditional legal context, I would share that, you know, it was really about, you know, me and what my needs were in that particular, you know, situation or time in terms of, of my energy levels and that type of thing. And that tended to land a lot better. And of course, again, it's always about backing it up with action. So it wasn't about being, you know, flaky or, you know, always just being like, oh no, you know, too precious, I can't do it. You know, it was actually about, again, you know, taking the time that I needed in order to replenish and to restore and to reflect and then showing up again in that next moon phase in those coming days and doing my best work. So then what happens is that you're able to build up again this concrete evidence base that then you're able to point to. It's like becomes a positive upward spiral of being able to say, hey, you know, see, I do know myself and I did undertake to get you that much better project or, you know, deliverable shipped by Friday and, and I did, you know, and you were happy with it. So trust my process is that implicit takeaway there. The more that you do that, then, you know, the more receptive people will be around you to just being able to pay attention and listen to, to what it is that you're saying is important to you. 
So last year when visiting wedding venues in Hawaii, I completely lost my voice. And how was I going to plan my wedding with no voice? Luckily, I came across Beekeeper's Natural Propolis Throat Spray and it literally saved my life. Made of high quality bee propolis, which is nature's antibiotic, I was able to get my voice back in no time, which led me to discovering their other products like their hemp honey, brain fuel, and superfood cacao honey, which is amazing. I highly recommend their products to all the bee lovers out there as they're on a mission to improve people's health while saving the bees. Get 15% off your order at beekeepersnaturals.com slash Sahara and use coupon code Sahara at checkout. Again, that is beekeepersnaturals.com slash Sahara with coupon code Sahara at checkout. Has life been very full recently? I like to say full instead of stressful because it's saying that you're so full of opportunities and responsibilities and obligations rather than them being stressors. But the thing is, sometimes your body actually feels that stress and it can turn into anxiety, pain, and even inflammation. As we know, the mind and body are connected. And that's when natural plant medicines come in. And one that I am a huge fan of is C. CBD. So one of my really good friends, Angie Lee, who has been on the podcast before, actually started her own CBD company with her brother, Mike Lee, a world-renowned boxer, when he was looking for something to help deal with the pain and stress and muscular tension of being a professional athlete without the THC. So together, they co-founded Soul CBD. Now, why I love this CBD, and it's my absolute favorite, is because they combine it with MCT oil, which, as we know, is really good for the body, good for the brain, hemp derived CBD isolate. So no THC, no psychoactive effects at all. He's a professional athlete. And like they talk about in the podcast episode, I did with them all about CBD. He couldn't have any THC in his CBD because they do regular drug testings and it is so delicious. I put a couple droplets. It just helps me go to sleep, helps me feel calm, helps with any muscular tension I have. If I worked out too much or I pulled my back and I absolutely love it. And they also have incredible CBD bath bombs, which are so beautiful. They make the best gifts ever and they're all natural with essential oils as well. So if you want to get your hands on this incredible pure CBD experience, head over to mysoulcbd.com and use coupon code Sahara at checkout. Again, it's mysoul, S-O-U-L-C-B-D.com and use coupon code Sahara at checkout. Is there an app that you recommend so we can constantly see what cycle the moon is at? So I tend to work more analog. I'm sorry to say I don't actually use an app. I do have a lunar planner, which I have created, which is like a a year at a glance, which people can download from my website if you're interested in taking a look. I know there are a lot of moon apps, but I tend to kind of go old school, which is firstly, you know, to look up and to see the moon in the sky and to try to really make that connection with with nature because that's one of the beautiful things in working with the moon cycle, of course, is is to have, you know, really be building that beautiful connection with these natural cycles. And for most of the month, we can actually, you know, see the moon. And so, and then failing that, you know, I have got this lunar planner, which is sort of an at a glance, you know, one page PDF, which has all of the dates of all of the moon phases mapped out in advance. And I recommend that, you know, people really use pen and paper and journal around how they're feeling and notice how they are feeling, how that correlates with what phase the moon is in. And the reason why that is so helpful is because, you know, never should any system, you know, take the place of our own connection with ourselves. You know, ultimately, you know, the best kind of systems are the ones that just point us home to ourselves. And so if the moon is used as sort of a mirror, as a muse in this way, but really as something which is going to trigger, you know, that deeper self-inquiry about what it is that we're feeling in any given moment, what is it that we need in any given given moment, then, you know, that's, I think, the real power and the takeaway of of this system. 
Mm, I love that. And that is so important to just have that intuitive relationship with the moon. You know, if you think of back and before we had technology, people would just look at the moon and we're like, you know, can be very digital about it. I think a lot of us live in cities that maybe we don't even see the moon often. So it is important to take time to even just like bathe, like moon bathe and be in nature where you can really feel her luminous light. I think most of us are missing that. Mm, oh my gosh, so much so. And when we rebuild that connection, you know, the the depth of the intuition that we can start to access inside of ourselves, that deep embodied wisdom which exists inside of all of us, you know, inside of the temples which are our bodies and to be able to connect in with that extraordinary wisdom of our heart and our soul, you know, the more we're in nature and the more that we connect with nature, even if we're in a city, you know, and I live in New York City and when I developed Lunar Abundance, you know, I was was living in Sydney, Australia, which is another large city. So, you know, there is something elemental which is missing from so many of our lives. And so I think that connection, you know, with the moon cycle can be a really beautiful gateway to start to reclaim that connection with nature, but also with ourselves and, and where we fit in this grander cosmos as well. Mm. So what if you're working on a big project, like you're doing a launch or, you know, something that's taking a lot of your energy, it's, it requires a lot of yang, a lot of action. How would you work with the moon phases when doing so? Mm. It's a really good question. And again, thinking about, you know, the doing and the being phases as being relative, it is the case, you know, the new moon is going to be relative to the full moon, for example, and each one of the moon phases will be relative to each other, but also each moon cycle can be relative to other moon cycles. So you can have a more doing oriented moon cycle, knowing then that you can, it will actually, you know, not just something you can do, but it will be really important for you to make sure that you're building in time in future where you're going to allow yourself to replenish and restore. And so you can have a season of your life, which is going to be more action oriented. But again, cultivating self-awareness, self-knowledge and deep self-care, deep, you know, deep self-love means that, you know, you're also going to, ha- you know, have to have a little bit of foresight and to go, okay, right, I'll go all in, in this particular, you know, phase of my life, you know, this particular moon cycle, this particular season of my life, because there is a greater objective, a big project, you know, maybe a book that needs to be birthed or a course or, you know, something else that is coming through. But, you know, factoring in a little bit of time in the future where you're going to be able to, you know, lean back, you know, put that switch down, you know, from the on, on, on all the time down into, you know, just off for a second, just allow yourself to relax at some stage in the future and build that into your planning process. And this isn't a nice to have, you know, this is actually a must have, particularly, you know, if you're someone who is, you know, very, very goal oriented and, and loves that process of, you know, of creation or, or of working, you know, and you can get a little bit lost in it. You know, it's so, so, so important to be able to, you know, have that permission at the other end just to breathe and not just rest, but also to reflect and celebrate on how far you've come. And this is something which is very much built into the moon moon phases as well is the eighth of the eight moon phases in the lunar abundance system is called the balsamic moon phase. And this is a phase which is, it's a being phase, it's a yin phase, and it's very much around reflection and also celebration of everything that you did right as a way of sort of rewiring this constant inner critic that so many of us have, which is so good at pointing out to us all the things that we're doing wrong, that we should be guilty about, you know, that we should be ashamed of, you know, that we're not going, you know, fast enough and hard enough. But building in, you know, this practice is a way of, you know, the practice of celebration and reflection is a way for us to be, you know, very gently trying to, you know, rewire our brain into being kinder with ourselves and more compassionate with ourselves. So that's the first part of the question, which is just, you know, zooming out a little bit, knowing you can have a more action-oriented period of your life, but knowing you need to build in a more uh, restful being-oriented period of your life after that, which could just be a couple of days of doing absolutely nothing, you know, but it just needs to be there. 
Then the other aspect of it, you know, if you're working on a on a project which is a, a really big project and which requires your all, then to look at the kind of ways that you could divide up, you know, your tasks even on a weekly basis throughout that project. So an example here is when I was writing my book. So when I was writing the Lunar Abundance book, which was a process which took a few months, you know, of real sort of deep diving work, then which I had to balance alongside of, of running a business and, you know, having other life obligations as well. It wasn't... I, I feel you, girl. It's a journey. <laughs> right? Exactly. It's like, what is this fantasy of where you just get to go and just like do I the know. thing? <laughs> that doesn't yeah, exist. Exactly. It's not real. <laughs> yeah. um, or if it is, I have never experienced it. So, you know, again, like what's this is a very practical way of starting to navigate this. So, for example, in the doing phases, what I would do is then, you know, I would have the much more kind of structural aspects of the project of writing the book project would be live for me. So this would be more of like the research or I would be using the Pomodoro technique, which is a technique where, you know, for a period of time, you know, 25 minutes or, you know, whatever period of time works for you, you'd sort of do a sprint. You'd say, this is a period of, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to achieve, you know, try to write, you know, 500 words in the next 25 minutes and I'm just going to go for it. And it doesn't matter if I don't want to do it. I'm going to work through that resistance. You know, it's a doing phase. I'm really going to get those words down on paper, you know, or to do things like put together the reference section of my book, which was a bit more fiddly and required a bit more, you know, sort of reference work. That was something I do in a doing phase. And then, you know, and again, the structural work. So really sort of putting together the structures of the whole book or on the chapters. Those are the kind of things that I would set up my week in advance. I'd plan and structure in my week and I do those kind of things in the doing phase. Then by comparison, in the being phases, I would allow myself, you know, these periods of time which would be a little more unstructured. So I might put, you know, two or three unstructured hours on my calendar on a being phase. And in that two or three hours, you know, I would give myself permission to like just write as many words as I wanted to. And if, you know, I wasn't really feeling the words coming through, you know, in that two or three hours period on that being phase, then that was okay. You know, I would allow myself just to go into a meditation or I would allow myself to close the laptop and go for a walk. And then what would often happen, because, you know, again, it wasn't like I was just in this full free flow of just, you know, I'll just see what happens. The book will write itself. No, it was actually really a structured process where I had the more doing phases as well. But in the context of that, in this broader container of the moon cycle, then allowing myself this unstructured time actually gave birth to much more creativity and you know, these real sort of breakthrough ideas, the kind of epiphanies that you only really get, you know, when you're allowing yourself to just break free from a structure or have or a routine or having to do, you know, a certain number of words or get to a certain number of outcomes within a certain hour. And I think everybody can relate to having, you know, been in the shower or been on the bus or the subway and being like, ah, oh, you know, that's the breakthrough idea, which is really going to be what is going to set that particular project or book apart. So it's around creating that environment and the container to be able to do both of those things. And whatever that looks like for you in terms of whatever your actual daily, you know, tasks are, you know, something which can be modified, but the doing and the being aspect of the moon phases gives a really beautiful practical structure to support that and to promote that. Mm, love that so much. And yes, totally feel you. Sometimes you just have to like carve those hours in, even if it doesn't make sense, you just, you just have to do it for yourself. And it's always where your best ideas come through. And sometimes it's not, but you just have to, you owe it to yourself to not just be like in that machine, because then you're just constantly regurgitating that same information. You need that breath of fresh air or a different type of conversation or something else to just stir things up a little bit. Yeah, just taking the space is, is oftentimes what can allow just that magic to emerge, just that serendipity, which can just be, be so delightful. Mm. So one question I have is, what if your menstrual cycle is not with the moon? Like some women bleed with the new moon, which from my tantric readings, the woman who bleed with the new moon, I don't know if you've really look, done a lot of research into this, but from what I've read, the woman who bleed with the new moon 
their bodies are more in that maiden phase. It's more of a fertile phase. So most women, at least back in the day before we had all this light pollution and we're really moon bathing, would bleed with that new moon. But then the wise woman, the priestess, the witch archetype, who wasn't really at that stage to be reproducing, but more of like holding that space would bleed with the full moon. However, now, and for myself, I mean, sometimes I switch back and forth and sometimes I just start bleeding and it's like a crescent moon or something. So how would we balance with what's happening inside of ourselves with our own, you know, moon cycles when it's different than what's happening with the actual planetary moon cycles? I love the question. And, you know, my answer to this when I'm asked this question is always don't worry about it. And the reason why I say that is because I find I get so many women who have contacted me over the years, like literally thousands of women who are in a state of like anxiety or worry that their bodies aren't doing it right. And so I feel like really the most important message that we can possibly say is, you know, just love and trust your body. You know, there's no need to try to make your body to fit into, you know, a system or a framework, you know, whether that be, you know, lunar or otherwise. And I would say that, again, you know, the vast majority of the people that that I hear from tend to have cycles which aren't synced with the moon. And so, again, you know, the invitation is always, you know, just to tune in. And if there's any kind of, you know, worry or concern that there may be a health issue or something along those lines, you know, obviously then to, you know, seek professional medical advice, but always, you know, to really love and trust and honour your body. Having said that, you know, when I find that people start working with the moon cycle, so to even just start tuning into the moon cycle and just start paying attention to the moon cycle, then a lot of the time, if they've had, say, issues with their bleeding, with their menstruation, you know, I hear over and over and over again, like, as oh my God, I had not had a period for three years. And then I started working with the moon and suddenly like the flow happened. Mm. And I just think, you know, that's such a beautiful takeaway from really, you know, what I think is the essence of the system, which is tuning into ourselves, you know, listening to what our body is trying to tell us and what our body needs at any one time in terms of, you know, how does she need to be nourished? You know, how does she need to be spoken to? You know, how does she really need to be treated? And, you know, listening to those signs of like, does she really need to rest? You know, does she need more nourishing food, which is just more aligned with with her? And so, you know, this practice, the lunar abundance practice is really what brings us so, so intimately into dialogue with ourselves. And there can be so many positive health effects as a result of that and starting to bleed again or starting to bleed more consistently, more regularly, you know, without uh, as much pain can often happen as well. I often hear that women who have been, you know, experiencing an enormous amount, you know, of physical pain in their menstruation, again, once they start to live in a more sustainable flowing way, find that then those kind of symptoms can fall away as well. And I just think that that's actually what we should be paying attention to and celebrating, you know, and if it syncs with the moon cycle, you know, and that's meaningful for you, then awesome. But I don't think we need to be sort of pushing our bodies to be doing, you know, any particular thing. I also think, you know, in the modern age, there's so many things, you know, which can affect and and which can, you know, really, you know, disrupt uh, our menstrual cycles. But I think that, you know, one of the main things can often be, you know, this immense, like, you know, pressure and shame that we can put on ourselves, you know, for not doing it right. And so, you know, the takeaway is really that kindness and and compassion and and self-love. Yeah, I think that's so important because I know I'm someone I could be like, in my head about, okay, it's the moon cycles, but then my menstrual cycle, and then what's happening astrologically, and then my dosha, and then, you know, my human design and my gene key and, you know, my past lives and <laughs> like it can be never ending. And I and I think it's just a really important reminder to just, you know, like take what feels good for you. I think different times of your life, like maybe different systems, different people, different systems, like for you, like this has been your life's work for someone else. It might be something they do and then they come back to, and it might be this like ebbing and flowing relationship for others. It may be all about the menstruation and following that. And I think it's just, you know, offering your consciousness, all of these different tools that are available to us that have streamed through the feminine and then having that feminine relationship with it of not holding onto it too tightly either. 
<laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> Yes. So good. Well, I am absolutely loving Lunar Abundance. How can listeners get your books, connect with you and learn more? Yes. Well, I'm on Instagram. So my Instagram handle is Ezzy Spencer. So that's spelled E-Z-Z-I-E, Spencer, S-P-E-N-C-R. And then I have actually set up a special page as well for your listeners, which has links to the free moon planner, which I mentioned for 2020. So all the dates of all of the moon phases coming up in 2020, as well as a link to the Lunar Abundance book, which is called A Lunar Abundance, Cultivating Joy, Peace and Purpose, Using the Phases of the moon. There's the companion workbook as well, which is around, you know, really sort of pulling out a lot more prompts and questions for self-inquiries, you know, helping you to set up intention setting ceremonies and, you know, full moon release rituals and all of that type of thing as well. And, you know, these are available wherever books are sold. So at the page which I've set up is ezispencer.com slash Sahara. So I'll send you the link and then maybe you can pop that link in. But if you just go to ezispencer.com slash Sahari, there's just one page and you can click and, and get all of the things. Perfect. We will definitely have that link in the show notes. And when is the January new moon? Oh, so the January new moon is on the 24th of January in the Northern Hemisphere. So again, that's an invitation to just start the practice then, even just by setting an intention. And so, you know, tuning in and getting very clear about what it is that you want to feel and what it is that you want to welcome into your life can be a really beautiful way to kick off 2020. So I invite you to start working with the practice at the new moon in January and to start to see the magic of the practice image. Love it. That's such a beautiful invitation. Thank you, Moon, for always allowing us each month to just start fresh and and co-create what it is that we really want and use the powers that are available to us to facilitate this process. So thank you, Ezzy, for being such a beautiful vessel for this divine knowledge and sharing with all of us today. It's been such a delight. Thank you so much for having me. Mm, so good. I know I'm going to be manifesting with that new moon. How about you? Do you know what you got in mind? I think I know. So she will be doing a live new moon webinar with us in Rose Gold Goddesses. So be sure to head over to rosegoldgoddesses.com to participate. Head over to Ezzy's website as well, ezzyspencer.com slash Sahara to get her free PDF and Make sure you use that moon, put it to work, bring it towards your goals. The universe is on your side. Astrology wants to be conniving with you for your dreams. So don't let your new moon go to waste. Manifest that shit. Let's rock the boat. So grateful for you. And if you loved this episode, I would love if you could leave me a review in the iTunes store. And as a free gift, I will share with you the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. Simply email a screenshot of your review over to sahara at eatfeelfresh.com. Again, sahara, S A H A R A at eatfeelfresh.com and I will send you over the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. Thank you and namaste. 